Right. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. My name is Christine Ingram. I'm the local interest librarian here at the New Hanover County Public Library. And with me tonight is Floyd McKissick, Jr. North Carolina Reads is the North Carolina Community's statewide book club for 2022. North Carolina Reads features five books that explore issues of racial, social, and gender equality and the history and culture of North Carolina. Any views, findings, conclusions, opinions, or recommendations expressed do not necessarily represent those of NC Humanities or the National Endowment for the Humanities. North Carolina Reads is made possible in part by A More Perfect Union, a special initiative grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And this program is uh, this program of the North Carolina Center for the Book and is provided by NC Humanities. The five selected books feature stories of American perseverance and diversity. The people, places, and events in these books also pose critical questions about how North Carolinians view their role in helping to form a more just and inclusive society. North Carolina Humanities hopes these stories encourage engaging, productive conversations among participants. At the heart of North Carolina Reads is North Carolina Humanities' desire to connect communities through shared reading experiences. Reading is important because it helps us develop our critical thinking skills, strengthens our minds, vocabulary, and mental health, and creates opportunities for us to empathize with other stories and experiences. February's book is Soul City, Race, Equality, and the Lost Dream of an American Utopia by Thomas Healy. Tonight's platform is via Zoom webinar. Uh, for those attending online, please type any questions or comments into the chat or Q&A box and I will moderate the Q&A discussion at the end, alternating between in-person and online as needed. Joining us tonight is Floyd McKissick Jr. He was the Services Director of Soul City from 1975 to 1980, former North Carolina Senator and Deputy Minority Leader of the North Carolina Legislative Black Caucus. Mr. McKissick, thank you so much for joining us and I'll turn that over to you. Well, thank you, Christine. It's a privilege and honor to be here. Uh, I particularly discuss Soul City. It's a project that's near and dear to my heart. And, uh, and, and of course, it was my father who was the developer of the project. Uh, not many people are aware of Soul City today, even though it was in the headlines at the time that it was being discussed and, and developed. Um, my father got the idea of building a, a new town due to, due to what he saw occur over in Europe uh, in the end of World War II, where you saw Americans going in and helping to rebuild areas that had been bombed and destroyed and things of that sort into uh, communities. And he was intrigued by how that all occurred, and what took place. Now, my, my father uh, was very fascinated with the idea of building a new town here in the United States, uh, pretty much beginning back in the 60s. Uh, my father had been very active in the civil rights movement, uh, here in North Carolina, as well as nationally. Uh, he had, was the first African-American student to attend the law school at UNC Chapel Hill. It's a case called McKissick versus Carmichael in the uh, late 40s, early 50s, where his attorney was um, Thurgood Marshall, the, who later became the first African-American justice in the U.S. Supreme Court. And he applied for admission to law school at UNC Chapel Hill. And he was ultimately uh, admitted with a small group of other students, but he got out of there. He was very committed and interested in civil rights and remained involved in civil rights here in North Carolina. Um, and my oldest sisters were involved in desegregating the public schools here in Durham back in 1959. And my mother was a plaintiff in a case that led to that. And I integrated, uh, you know, uh, elementary school uh, a few years later here in, in Durham. My dad went on to become involved with an organization called CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, and in doing so, he served as the national chairman of CORE and later as the national director of CORE, and he was among those 10 civil rights leaders that spoke to the very famous march on Washington where Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech and, uh, and met with President Kennedy that day. And, and of course, you know, as a result of my dad's involvement in the civil rights movement and, uh, and, and all that that in, in all that, that was going on in that time frame, including the discussion of the idea of black power. Uh, black power is a unique term, a unique ideology. And he was one of those ones that tried to articulate what that meant. And he articulated to mean political power, uh, to mean economic power, to discuss entrepreneurship. 
uh, when he, during the time he was with Gore, he took a sabbatical uh, with a group called Mark up in New York City. And during that time frame, he came up with the idea of building a new town in North Carolina uh, that was later to become what we know today as Soul City. Um, and he had announced that idea at that time frame. He had named the community at that point in time. Uh, there was legislation that was passed back in the 60s known as the Urban Growth and New Communities Act of 1968. It allowed for the development of new towns in the United States. And there were actually about 14 new communities started in the United States during that time frame. Um, most of those communities, what we would call suburban new towns, which are outside of major established urban areas um, or, or cities, as the case may be. Um, there were also what they call new town in town projects, which are projects that were built on urban renewal land within an urban city where there might have been blight in neighborhoods that were in condition where they were determined to be uh, hazards to health and safety, and that it was better to go in and, and remove them and, and rebuild projects and there were two new towns that went in as new town in towns in those type of situations. Soul City was the first what they call free and only freestanding new town which meant that it was going to be built outside of a major urban area. It was not going to be a suburban community. It wasn't going to be built in an inner city on urban renewal land. It was a city that was going to be out in a rural area but um, they would need to establish their own economic base, their own employment base, to build their own water and sewer systems and all of that type of thing. So Seoul City became the only new town started underneath this HUD program. Probably the most successful one established under the HUD program was the Woodlands out in Texas, which was pursued by Mitchell Energy and Electric Company. Uh, what HUD required you to do to become a new town was to prepare a plan for how you would develop your project. Um, most new town projects were gonna anticipate it to be developed over a 25 to 30 year time frame, And then they looked at your peak indebtedness level over what was projected to be that 30 year or 25 year cycle. And once they determined what that was based upon financial models and economic models and marketing models, then that was determined to be your peak level indebtedness and you were able to sell bonds to basically fund your development with the idea that the bond money should cover you at your peak level of indebtedness. So in Seoul City's case, we got actually one of the smallest amounts of federal loan guarantee. It was $14 million. We sold $5 million worth of bonds in March of 1974, as I recall, the second five million was in December of 76 or 77. We did not sell our last four million dollars in bonds because we were not allowed to do so. Um, we went in and, and acquired uh, 3,600 acres of land in rural Ward County. It was land that was right on US 1, major north south route. It was also land along the Seaboard Coastline Railroad, which made it good for. Uh, industrial purposes and it was only about a mile and a half off Interstate 85. And it was located uh, about 10 miles south of the Virginia line on Interstate 85, um, north of Henderson. And uh, uh, it was kind of one of those areas that we could consider prime for development in that time frame. We were the only new town that had a minority development company. Um, and my father was, of course, that developer. It was a partnership, National Housing Partnership, and with Madison Madison International, which was an engineering architecture firm, minority firm out of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we began building and constructing um, the development, you know, in 1974. When we got that loan guarantee, we did do some work before then. It involved building roads involved building water and sewer systems. We were instrumental in building the, what was then the largest regional water system in North Carolina, um, which brought in water from Kerr Lake at over 800 shoreline miles, and provided water to Seoul City and Warren County, as well as water to Henderson and over in Vance County and Oxford over in Granville County. Uh, that project ran, as I recall, about $12 million, about $9 million Soul City was instrumental in bringing to the table, um, but you had to have a water supply. 
So, you know, Soul City helped build and was instrumental in building that water supply. You had to have roads. So we built roads. We built, uh, you know, some new roads. We repaved some of the gravel roads that were there. We came up with a master plan. Master plan showed us building this community out over that 30 year time frame. At one time, we thought about acquiring up to 52 acres of land, 5,200 acres of land, as opposed to 3,600. But in the end, we bought the 3,600 acres and we're planning to develop it into three different villages. It would be mixed use development with, of all types of residential, single family, multifamily apartments, would have a major uh, downtown. Uh, that was the type of project was envisioned. Uh, it was envisioned as a place where people of all races would live and work harmoniously together. Um, it was not envisioned as an all black city. It was envisioned that African Americans would have opportunities to serve in leadership positions. Um, if they were city planners, they could be city planners in Seoul City. If they were engineers or architects, they could work there. If they were people involved in public management or in business, or if you were in construction trades, whatever it may be, there was a place for you in Seoul City. Um, and, uh, and Seoul City became, I think, in my mind, successful in building that nucleus of infrastructure that was necessary, the roads, the water, the sewer. Uh, but uh, one thing that happened really about a year into our development, uh, Jesse Helms uh, was elected to the U.S. Senate. Uh, when he was elected to the U.S. Senate uh, in 1972, and shortly thereafter, Seoul City, you know, stole its first bonds in 74, but he pretty much announced that he was going to try to stop development. Uh, he indeed uh, asked for audits and investigations to be done. Uh, the Raleigh News and Observer carried all types of headline stories uh, suggesting there was some type of fraud or improprieties or the funds may not have been accounted for. And they basically uh, halted development for about a year, year and a half, and brought in a team of investigators from the uh, General Accounting Office out of Washington people from the Justice Department and everything else. They did their investigations. They came back, found out there was no fraud. There was no improprieties. Money was accounted for. But, you know, Soul City got a lot of negative publicity in that time frame. Um, Senator Helms had been someone who was a diehard segregationist. Um, he was opposed to my father in the civil rights movement to his efforts to further civil rights here in the state of North Carolina in that effort and nationally. Uh, and he was a foe, and he could, he, the only thing that explains why a senator would want to stop the flow of federal funds coming into their state, uh, um, you know, as well as, you know, people who are in Congress, Elliot Fountain kind of went along with Helms in that time frame, uh, because he thought that was the right thing to do, but, you know, uh, racism can do a lot of things to poison your heart and your mind. I mean, we built a uh, outpatient medical facility that more than doubled the availability of healthcare services to people in Warren County. Uh, when I say that, you know, they allow people to pay for healthcare services based upon their income. For most people who had low incomes, they paid virtually nothing. They had a van service that went to feed people up and brought them to Health Co. They had doctors and dentists uh, and really cared for people in a meaningful, significant way. Like, I remember at one point they were getting ready to open up a pharmacy and Elms was opposed to even them getting a a license for controlled substances to give out prescriptions. So, you know, you have to think about what would cause that. We built the only recreational facilities that were open to the public in more advanced Granville counties of people of all races. Uh, you know, after segregation ended um, and integration occurred, a lot of places that had public pools closed them down rather than have blacks and whites using the same swimming pool together. But, you know, at swimming pools, tennis courts, people bought homes in Seoul City. Um, um, homes that were very reasonably priced, uh, where they got them for very reasonable cost. Um, so, I mean, Seoul City made significant progress. I mean, we could, it was a countywide high school, wasn't built in Seoul City, but near Seoul City. I think the cost was $1.6 billion at the time. We contributed $1 million toward that cost to build that countywide high school. Um, and it was instrumental in getting them another $400,000 of money to help build that project at the time frame. Um, you know, it extend water and sewer lines out there to the area. So, I mean, Soul City helped change Warren County. 
Um, we brought in people like Eva Clayton, who later became a congressperson from uh, from a congressional district that included Soul City and Warren County, who uh, worked as, in our social planning department. Uh, Harvey Gant later became Mayor of Charlotte, was the first city planner that was hired at Soul City. I later became director of planning in 1975. I worked in the planning department beginning in 74, where I was involved in preparing federal grant applications and having to get state and local government approval for all of our plans for roads, water and sewer and the like for subdivisions uh, when land had to be zoned or rezoned as the case may be. Uh, people like George Williams worked there who later went on to be in charge of economic development out in Oakland, California, we later became a county manager here in Durham. A very talented group of individuals who really uh, um, helped lead Soul City uh, and a multiracial team of individuals that were working there for the Soul City company. I think about a quarter or 30% of the staff was, was white. Uh, I think one thing people had a hard time thinking about when they thought about Soul City, they might think about a city that was white primarily and had 20% black and 25% black and 30% black, and they thought of it as being integrated. It was hard for people to think about a community that might be 70% black, but 30% white and of other races, and think about that as being integrated. Somehow in the minds of some people, that was an all black town, but they didn't think of it being an all white city. If there was say a 20, 25% black living there. Um, and, I, and I think that's the perceptional issue that was challenging for some. Uh, I think Soul City epitomized a dream for many. People in Warren County, historically at left Warren County, going to urban areas, looking for jobs and opportunities, but frequently finding themselves living in urban areas like New York City or, and the like in, in slums uh, where they were deprived of opportunities and that land of opportunity that they hoped to find wasn't always there. So Soul City represented an alternative where they could find jobs in Soul City uh, or, or opportunity in Soul City or a quality of life in Soul City that they might not have had before. Ward County was 68% black at the time that the land for Soul City was purchased. So if you just reflected the balance of population in that county, you might've had a 68% black community. That's not all black. Warren County would never thought of as all black. But you know, when you talked about Soul City, somehow people, even though there was about 30% white population there at the time in other races, they thought of it as an all black town, which in some minds, uh, people did not like the idea, could not support. Uh, Soul City did well during its years. Unfortunately, in uh, June 28th of uh, 1979, uh, HUD said that they would no longer continue supporting the project. It didn't allow us to sell our last $4 million in bonds. And unfortunately, the project uh, within about a year and a half folded. Much of the land was sold off, but not before we had built a fire station there, and built a large manufacturing facility there called uh, Called the Warren Mega, well, the Warren Industrial, within the Warren Industrial Park was called Soltech Building. We had our offices there in about 20,000 square feet of space. The total building is about 73,000 square feet. They had a housing company that operated out of there. You had Warren Manufacturing, which is a company that built products for the military. Um, you, you saw a lot of things built in that time frame. Uh, you know, water lines were extended over to Warrington and Orlando to help build and develop the entire region. We probably attracted a total of about 29 million of investment uh, over the, our development cycle, which extended roughly from, you know, we sold the bonds in 74 and over about a five, six year period, we got, we got a lot done, a lot was constructed. So I consider Soul City a success, even though it did, never came to fruition to be, become the community that we all envisioned a dream of that might've been 30,000 people living there. The infrastructure still exists today. Uh, some of the residents that moved there then remain there today. There's probably no more than probably about 50 homes there today or so. Uh, but, uh, but I think many people under, who came to Soul City came with a pioneering attitude, with an aspirational attitude that wanted to live and be part of the American dream and uh, wanted the same thing that anybody else would want any other place in America. Uh, so I, 
that's kind of a summary. It probably went on a little bit longer than anticipated, but I welcome any questions you might have. That was a fantastic summary. That really did sum up and, um, you know, again, some of the participants have not been able to read the book, um, but that did get a, a very good kind of overview of, of the history of the project. Um, what, uh, just out of my own curiosity, what is the, um, what do you think is the number one hindrance that occurred? Because it seemed like what Thomas Healy did was kind of lay out all of this. It seemed like it was just one thing after another, after another. What do you think was the number one hindrance to the project being a long-term success? Well, I, I would say that certainly the attacks we received from Senator Helms and, uh, and from the News and Observer established doubt and really attacked our credibility. And, and even though, it, you know, when you see those type of newspaper articles and they are, are published day after day, week after week, month after month, and then even when you get the clean bill of health and says, and everybody says everything was fine, unfortunately, that story runs one day and all the headlines ran for perhaps weeks or months, you know, over weeks or months. And sometimes they were there on the front page. Uh, sometimes they were comments on the editorial page and uh, you know it created a lot of doubt it created a lot of uncertainty and when you were going out to uh, companies all across America trying to get them to build manufacturing facilities in Seoul City uh, notwithstanding your locational attributes of having an industrial park that was 500 acres having a spur line for the railroad, being right off of US-1. I mean, we, we adjoined US-1, being within a mile of Interstate 85, within 30 minutes of Interstate 95. I mean, amazing attributes that people would envy. Um, when people had doubts about its future and doubts about its certainty and saw it being attacked, even though the allegations weren't true, those were things were difficult to overcome. I mean, we had a number of business and industries that were right there at the border and the crossroads ready to do something, but they ultimately decided they didn't want to become involved in a project that might be controversial or make a multi-million dollar investment in a location that was envisioned to be a full city at some point that may not truly come to fruition the way it was planned. So I think that uncertainty serve to sabotage the ability of the Soul City Company to accomplish um, many of the goals we get sought in terms of building um, and bringing industry there and building an economic base, and providing jobs. There were jobs related to construction, but those jobs had a beginning and those jobs had an end when the project, you know, when that particular construction project was finished. But to have those ongoing jobs that were needed become very, became very, very challenging. And I think that was probably the greatest handicap that we faced. And unfortunately, some of that, some of that doubt was, was, was instilled as a result of disbelief that an African-American development company had the audacity to do what we were attempting to do. Thank you for that. Um, I do have a question from online. Uh, what do you see as the future of Soul City? Is there a prospect of reviving it at all? I think it's possible to see a revival of the project, not at the magnitude of scale that was originally envisioned when it was, when all the land was acquired. I mean, we acquired that 3,600 acres. I mean, we could have easily built a community to support 30,000 people. But I think that with the roads and water and sewer in place and all that type of thing, as people are priced out of the major urban areas in North Carolina, like Raleigh and Durham and Chapel Hill, <laughs> that they're going to start moving out to places like Oxford. They're going to start moving out to places like Henderson. And they can move out to places like Seoul City because they're within a reasonable commuting district. And when I say reasonable commuting distance, you can get in your car and drive 45 to 50 minutes uh, outside of Durham and 
be in Soul City or outside of Raleigh, you could be there. I think the biggest problem is that you'd have to find a development company that would come in and reacquire the land and have that vision. Uh, it might be more challenging to reacquire and reassemble that acreage. Could you assemble part of it? Yes. Could you uh, get it revitalized and have a marketing plan? Yes. And I think that would work. And I, and I think one thing that we were working on during our development period that uh, we didn't have a chance to really get off the ground, but we had launched a campaign uh, about the time that HUD pulled the plug on us that was going into places like New York and Newark and other places, cities in the Northeast Washington. And you're finding people there that had migrated to the South long ago, and they might have gotten good jobs. They might have bought homes, but they were ready to retire and come back home. Uh, I think today there are people ready to, to leave and, and do what I call a reverse migration back to a place where it's quieter, it's more peaceful. They can look up at night and see the stars and in the evenings in the summer hear the crickets. And uh, does that have an appeal? I think the answer is absolutely yes. Could there be people like that wanting to return? Yes. The reason we had thought about building on that market was due to the fact that we were having challenges building the employment base. But when you get retirees, you don't need a employment base. <laughs> They've already got to that point in place in that station in life where they do have residual income from retirement or from Social Security. So it became more appealing to them. And I think it, as a retirement destination, it could, be, it could still be very attractive. Great, thank you. Um, a couple more questions from the online audience. Uh, how is Soul City and the Northeast area of North Carolina marketed today by economic development entities? And then on addition to that, kind of, um, kind of just writing on the back of that, especially now that many people can work remotely, does this bode well for the revival of Soul City? And is there interest from developers in doing so? Well, there are entities involved in marketing land up in that part of the state of North Carolina, yes. Um, so, you know, they, they're out there and they're, I mean, how aggressive they're pursuing it, I do not know. Um, uh, you know, but I know there's been interest on several occasions, uh, to buy some of that acreage. Uh, a lot of the acreage in the, uh, industrial park was actually bought by Purdue Farms years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and they built a hatchery there at one point. Uh, and I think a feed mill, that type of thing. But it was mostly supplying farmers in the area that had chicken houses. Uh, what really truly providing the kind of jobs this whole city would have envisioned or that, um, that was truly needed for the area. Uh, you know, there was uh, a decision made, I don't know, back in the 80s, I believe it was, to build a correctional facility out near some city, um, which kind of rejoins some of the area that we, the Soul City Company own land, but not in Soul City itself. So, I mean, um, it certainly provides jobs for people in the area. Um, I don't think my father, if he were alive, uh, would have thought that this would have been, have been the kind of jobs he would have wanted <laughs> for, as part of a prison. <laughs> but. <laughs> But, but nevertheless, they, they, they are there. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, the major office building that we built, the Soltech building, it had about 74,000 square feet. It was actually acquired by Correction Enterprises. Uh, and they have inmates over there building things. I don't know what they do. But uh, uh, not exactly what would have been envisioned at that time as being the type of um, enterprise that would have been. Um, thought of as being the, the type that they were more interested in attracting this whole city. But nevertheless, that's what has occurred. Um, in terms of developers, I think there could be development interest that would occur, but you gotta have people who are out there looking, saying, I read an interesting story, observed an interesting story in the last month or so about escalating housing prices. And they pointed to Henderson, which is, basically 15 minutes away from Seoul City. And if I'm not mistaken, I think they said in the last year and a half, prices for homes had gone up 
somewhere close to 40, 50 percent, if you can imagine that. Rapid escalation. Now, you know, who knows about the, the factual accuracy of that news story, but uh, considering how much prices have increased in the Raleigh-Durham area uh, in the last uh, year to two years, uh, yeah, I would not be surprised if people found it as a very, very undervalued market. And I think the same potential could occur up in Soul City where people see that vacant land and see, hey, we can go in there and develop it and, and uh, entice people to uh, have a quality of life here that they uh, couldn't afford if they were living in, in cities like Raleigh and Durham. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think everywhere has really seen that kind of increase. And we, yeah, we see, you know, outside of the city here in Wilmington, how much prices are going up both in the area and then right outside sure. as well. And I know that Raleigh Durham is making national headlines with how the, yeah, the they housing, are. housing prices there. So um, and then another question, is Soul City part of the North Carolina African-American Heritage Trail? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. It certainly should be. Yeah. It should be a part of it, but not that I'm aware of. One thing I can remember when I was at Soul City, uh, it used to be a, an area where a house had been built years before in one of these large plantation homes. We restored one of them, the Green Duke House, mm -hmm. which actually had served at one point as a Confederate uh, hospital uh, during the Civil War. Uh, that was on the land that we owned. But it was another site there where nothing remained but a very tall chimney. Uh, the house had been destroyed by fire. But there was a cemetery right next door. And you could go to that cemetery. And the fascinating thing to me was that there were probably a, a dozen or more headstones that were from slaves in that area. Yeah. And the way you knew it was a slave is that they only identified the person by first name and put the number of years the person lived. So it might say Ned, 35, or whatever the name would be. And, and I found it absolutely intriguing. I can remember uh, going up there with a, a friend of mine who uh, took some paper and uh, thin tracing paper and put it over the headstone, and traced it out with a pencil to kind of uh, memorialize what it, what it looked like. And, uh, yeah. But uh, and I can remember trying, at one point we actually, created a trail that someone could walk, which is roughly about a mile or so, to see that, that cemetery and to, and to look. Because the fascinating thing was, there were places where you could stand on the land, you look out over the horizon, and someone would say, where, where is Soul City and what will it be? And from that vantage point, all the land you could probably visually see was land owned by the Soul City Company. Wow. Yeah, I thought that, you know, it was such a kind of touching idea that the, you know, and I, and I think your father had talked about this, that that land had been, had been worked by slaves and then was then meant to be kind of owned and operated as, an, as a town of true equality. And just kind of trying to create that, that narrative and storyline was really, was really beautiful. Um, so I, I do have a question for you. Um, what were some of the major lessons that you all learned from Soul City? And if you had to do it again, or if you were to do it again, what would you do differently? Well, one thing's for sure, the HUD program uh, that was established, the, uh, you know, the New Communities Administration, it was the outgrowth of the Urban Growth and New Communities Act. Uh, they were not aware of, well, of the needs to make decisions quickly and to approve things that we wanted to do so that we could actually go out and do it in a timely way. And they didn't even realize the time value of money, what it meant to delay decisions three months, six months, eight months, a year. You know, I can remember working on our budgets and submitting those budgets and uh, we anticipated our budgets would be reviewed and approved within 30 to 45 days. And, and you weren't supposed to spend money on projects until a, you had an approved budget. And it would be six, eight, 10 months later. The budget still wouldn't be approved and you're sitting there dealing with them. Uh, and it's delaying everything that you want to do. 
uh, and that you like to proceed in doing. So, I mean, if, if, if the government were to have a new communities administration or there was another Soul City project, I would almost be reluctant to get involved with the government in terms of developing it and pursuing it unless you had people that really understood the intricacies of development. Um, you know, as, develop, as the director of planning, it was up to me to chart out where our water and sewer lines might go, what roads we needed to get, you know, uh, cut, designed, cut, graded, you know, built, or, or if there was other recreational facilities, whatever it was. And in many instances, I had prepared grant applications. And I realized after a while that I was not always dealing with people that understood what land development was all about or the applications I was preparing. So enhance the chance of getting a project done. Let's say it was a water and sewer project. I describe it as beginning at point A, going to point B, going to point C, going to point D. And then I submit another application describing it as going from point D to point C, to point B, to point A. And it was submitted along with maybe a dozen other great applications. And you know, they sit there sometimes and approve them both that literally describe the same project because people did not understand what they were looking at. So, I mean, you know, would I want to deal with the a governmental agency at that level? You had people that did not understand and it were going to be obstacles to progress. I would be very challenged to want to do that. Likewise, I would be perhaps wanting to know that you built a development team that could overcome any perceptions that might be out there. Uh, and when I say that, the, 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 the perception of this being an African-American development company building a, a city and a new town project, I think if we had not been an, an African-American development pride, uh, company, they would have been woke. They wouldn't have had stories written in the News and Observer. They wouldn't have been attacked as we were attacked. Uh, they wouldn't have had their credibility called into question as we were. I mean, you know, I can remember living in Worcester, Massachusetts at one point. And outside of Worcester, there used to be a development that I would pass by occasionally. It was called White City East. And I can remember saying to somebody, you think only white people live in White City East? They say, oh, that's ridiculous. Of course not. I mean, we got cities in North Carolina called Whiteville. I don't think anybody thinks yes, white people live there. But yet this whole perception about an African-American development company and a town called Soul City, people could not understand, could not relate to. Perhaps now in you know, the year 2022, it might be perceived differently, but uh, it was a challenge. And you, you, you'd have to think about a way to overcome that. Perhaps you are an African-American development company, but you don't tell anybody. <laughs> and you come up with a name that's so neutral uh, that it's, it's like mayonnaise. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I guess give you my uh, gut intuitive reaction to that. Um, and then there's another question. Uh, who currently owns Soul City outside of the people who own their residences? So how did that land get broken up once um, HUD pulled the funding and, and kind of what happened from uh, that point on? Well, sure, once the, the HUD pulled the funding, uh, the land was sold and, you know, it went to multiple owners, um, people that I don't know of, uh, you know, I've met a few of them over the years. You know, I own some land up that way, you know, uh, that I wouldn't mind doing something with one day and developing at some point. But, you know, at the right time, I remember thinking about doing it back in the, uh, I guess, the early 90s or so. In the country went into one of those recession cycles. <laughs> you always want to be on the right side of a recession cycle. That's exactly right. So, you know, right now, all of that lands in private ownership, though. 
Um, what do you, what are some of the, you, you talked a little bit about the healthcare facility that was there and was able to you know, double the amount of health, health coverage for the county. What are some of the other kind of longer lasting impacts for Warren County that came out of your project? Yeah, well, when I talk about that regional water system, it still continues to this day. Wow. Um, you know, that water system was ultimately extended from Soul City over to the town of Warrington in Warren County. Uh, the portion that went to Henderson and Vance County has now been extended all the way over to Franklin County. Wow. So I mean, we're talking about, and, and, and even during the years I was in the Senate, there was a time when they were came there wanting to expand that water system to literally double its capacity because mm -hmm. there's so much demand today for water. And Franklin County wanted to get as much of that water as they could get. So, I mean, is that a living legacy? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, that countywide high school that got built, um, Warren County would have never had the tax base to build the type of countywide high school that got built in that time frame. I'm sure there's students going there today that have no idea that Soul City and the New Communities Administration uh, funded probably uh, over two thirds of the cost of that project. Mm. You know, those recreational facilities are still open today. Uh, they were owned by the Soul City Company, and really we call it the PRA, the Parks and Recreation Association, but they were um, dedicated to Warren County. They're still open today. The fire station that was built, the fire trucks that were um, that were acquired. There's the station is still there. The trucks are still there. They are still operational today. So, you know, uh, it's, it's some of that living legacy that I speak of, you know, uh, in terms, I mean, we expanded the sewer treatment plant over in Warren County. Uh, I think it was at a cost of about three and a half million dollars or so, but, uh, the county still benefits from that today. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of that infrastructure and, you have to understand, when HUD approved this project, we were approved for the purpose of building the infrastructure. We were prohibited from actually building homes. Now we did at one point, very, very late in our development cycle, get approval that we could do some limited development, but at that time they were pulling the plug. But we, we were not, I mean, they wanted us to build the land, did not build the land buy the land, acquire the land, build the infrastructure, take the approved land and sell it to other developers or sell it to like industry. Uh, so that was what our goal was. So when I talk about building this infrastructure, we were a development company that was supposed to take the raw land, the unimproved land, mm -hmm. to put all of that in, to put in underground electric service and the like, so that it was improved and it could be resold. That was what our contract with the government said. So when people said, why didn't you build houses? We were prohibited in the contract from literally building the houses. They yeah. thought that would represent a conflict of interest. Yeah. Yeah. It really, really seemed so much like this, you know, you could, it was such a cycle. You know, they wouldn't come until that was built and they wouldn't build that until they came. And it was just went back and forth so many Chicken. times. Chicken and egg, the whole thing, you know, yeah. and, and then, you know, and then, you know, when they talked about how they determined our peak level of indebtedness, right. at that point, we were looking at uh, doing modeling, and we thought our modeling was sophisticated. We assumed a 6% compounded rate of inflation. I mean, mm -hmm. this year, inflation has come to the mind of public again, because it's the highest rate since the 80s. Well, we assumed back in the 70s, 6% compounded rate of inflation. What we didn't assume when we were doing our modeling was that you would have an air oil embargo mm. and the price of a barrel of oil would go from $6 a barrel up to $38 a barrel yeah. Yeah. within six months. Yeah. And rather than a 6% compounded rate of inflation, you had, you know, oil products. And when I say oil products, the asphalt in roads, the PVC in pipes, everything that was a petrochemical product escalating multifold, yeah. literally overnight. Right. Uh, and you had to go ahead and continue the building and the development, notwithstanding those rapidly escalating prices and build projects that were, you know, that, that you basically said you would do yeah. under your contract with the government. But, you know, perhaps right now with the interest 
uh, and what could happen to the price of oil because of what's happening in the Ukraine. <laughs> uh, people might get an idea of what, and because of the inflation that's occurred this year in particular, right. relative to uh, what occurred back in the 80s, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we went through a time frame, but back then, you know, interest rates on mortgages was at 10%. Right. And people were still buying homes. Yeah, and we, we, ha we have seen that even in the last couple of years with building projects, at least here, building projects going on and the contracts are signed and then the price of lumber absolutely goes through the roof and then you can't find it either. And so the project has been pushed back two years. I mean, we've seen kind of some, you know, how that kind of functions today as well. Um, so switching gears a little bit, um, what are some of your favorite memories from being in Soul City? Because that seemed like such a, uh, a, a family is what it really kind of read. And sure. that, you know, situation could have been different living it. But what were some of your favorite memories from that? Well, I very much enjoyed the camaraderie that existed between everybody who lived there, and worked there. I mean, we were like a one big family, to be honest with you. Uh, we knew each other. We spent many, 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 many hours together. And uh, that warmness, that camaraderie, that working for that common purpose, for that dream, for those aspirations that we've all uh, committed to, to, to see coming to reality and to fruition. And to see so many of the projects that we envision built. I mean, it's, it's one thing when you sit there and you... You're sitting there on a drafting table and you're envisioning where the road will go, where the water and sewer lines will go, where the underground electric will go, where those recreational facilities will get built. And then to see it become a reality, to see that raw land transformed and to see it you know, come to fruition and to kind of put your fingerprint on that physical landscape. Uh, it's very satisfying. And to see the families move in and, and enjoy you know, walking down the, the bike trails and and, uh, and sitting there enjoying the quality of life that you thought and envisioned that they could enjoy if they just had that opportunity. Granted, it didn't become a project of a scale that we would have preferred, but when you saw all of that occur, um, and as a city planner, I mean, you know, my, my first master's degree was in city and regional planning, uh, you know, and specializing in land use planning. I, I enjoyed seeing those projects that I worked on go from concept to reality. Yeah. Very nice. Um, very nice. All right. And then another question. Um, so was your father kind of this larger than life hero or was he just your dad <laughs> growing up? I mean, well, he, was led, he led a very interesting life. He led a very interesting life. I mean, I had kind of a front room seat to history and the civil rights movement. You know, I marched with my dad, walked with my dad, marches down in, you know, down in Mississippi, you know, uh, with Dr. King, and, uh, Martin Luther King and Stokely Carmichael and folks like that. You know, I would see my dad, you know, on Sunday mornings, you know, sometimes I might go to a TV studio with him. He was on programs like, you know, Face the Nation and on CBS or uh, Meet the Press or Issues and Answers it used to be a program on ABC or when we, we moved to the New York area and we were there, I mean, I guess a total of about eight years or so, but, you know, I grew up during my high school years in New York City and, you know, I would see him, you know, we, he was larger than life to many others, even though he was a dad to me, but, you know, yeah. um, you know, but yeah, I mean, you, you go to the studios, and check them all out. You sit back in the green room, you check out the cameras, the way the production teams work. I used to find it intriguing. But the, people, the thing people don't realize, the civil rights movement was a struggle, not just for people who were out there protesting that were involved in sit-ins, demonstrations, voter registration drives, and all that type of work. But, but it was a business for my dad as a leader. Because you'd have to go to the receptions, uh, you know, two or three receptions in a single day sometimes where you were raising money to support all of that, to, to keep the money in the organization, to pay the overhead, to pay the expenses, to get the gas in the cars, to pay those people who were out there conducting the voter registration drives. I mean, they were basically volunteers, but they got small stipends and some people got a little bit more if they were in more 
senior positions, but you know, it, it was a lot to that. But it was a fascinating childhood and a fascinating upbringing, and I, uh, I, I, I enjoyed it immensely. And you know, I saw the way people admired and respected my dad. But you know, when he was a dad, I mean, he, you know, I'd tell him what I was thinking or share with him my thoughts, and they may not be the same with his. You know, but he learned to respect my individualism and, and the fact that we could work together with a sense of mutual respect and camaraderie, but also think differently together. I mean, at times I wrote papers or speeches or things on his behalf. It wouldn't have been necessarily what I would have said, but I knew how he thought. So, yeah. you know, you just, you know, you, and you did it the very best that you could yeah. uh, and, and to make sure that it sounded exactly as it needed to sound. Uh, and uh, I think we developed a lot of uh, what I call mutual respect over the years uh, in, in the way that we worked together uh, on the Soul City Project and, and later in life as attorneys, uh, mm -hmm. even though I did work with other law firms in other cities, you know, after I got out of law school. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it takes such... A, it takes a lot to be able to work with family as well on that day-to-day -day basis. And with such a important project and such a, I guess, a, an emotionally invested project too. Um, it's wonderful. You all had that, that kind of com that camaraderie and also that sense of mutual respect. Um, I do have another question from the online chat. Uh, I wonder if Soul City could be an incubator community for 3D printed homes, much less expensive to build while trend setting and very modern. Um, and I think that brings up a good point too of, you know, with time, time, the, the times that have changed, you know, there are different kinds of technologies out there that could make things less expensive in some ways or be an incubator project. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a great idea. I mean, I think the thing you do, you sit down and investigate its feasibility, what it takes, how you go about, uh, you know, caring for that, that whole concept. I think it's a great idea. I mean, I... I had somebody recently tell me that, you know, some of the land I had up there, I, I needed to think about putting in some of these mini homes for people who want to live kind of a minimalist lifestyle. And, you know, I've thought about it. I haven't gotten to the point of doing it yet. I often thought it might be a great little place for a summer camp for kids. <laughs> they have some wonderful little cabins that they could, uh, you know, use and enjoy. You know, who, who knows? But, uh, but no, I, I, I like that idea. It's a great idea that, you know, there's so many things that are interesting and intriguing that it, it, the mind is limitless in terms of coming up with things that could be carried out that are probably quite viable. It's just finding the time and resources to pull it together and, and people who are motivated to do it. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Um, all right, well, we are approaching the end of our hour. If there are any other questions, please feel free to put those into the chat and q and I'm going to give a quick little rundown to close up. Mr. McKissick, thank you again so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. Um, I, um, so all of those who have attended online, uh, there is going to be a very short survey emailed to you uh, in about an hour. I would greatly appreciate any kind of feedback or um, I would appreciate any feedback that you all have for me. Um, and then also we do have a couple of upcoming events. On the 28th, the um, North Carolina Humanities Council will be putting on a virtual conversation with um, Thomas Healy and Dr. Kofi Boone about the book Soul City. You can register for that on, um, we actually do have a link on our calendar to that program. Also um, in March, we have um, Anna, Prado, uh, Anna Pardo from the North Carolina Justice Center's Human uh, Workers' Rights Project coming to do a talk in relation to the March book, which is The Last Ballad by Wiley Cash. Um, and then in April, our speaker will be Chief, uh, Chief Elder Jacobs from the Waccamaw Tribe for the book, Even As We Breathe by Annette Sinook Lapsaddle. Um, and there will be everybody attending online. There will be an email about all of those upcoming events. Um, let's see, and there are lots of thank you very much. Uh, love the book and the discussion. Um, and thank you very much, Mr. McKissick for bringing the, this part of North Carolina history alive. 
Uh, thank you all for joining us. Oh, let me see, I have one more. Oh, there we go. Um, and Mr. McKissick, do you have any closing thoughts? Well, no, I've enjoyed spending time with you this evening. And uh, if anybody has any follow-up questions, and they can certainly send them to you and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. And, uh, uh, you, you know, I've enjoyed sharing with you my thoughts and perceptions related to Soul City. I'm sure uh, Mr. Healy will have his own to share, uh, many of which will probably be similar. Some that might be a little bit different based upon our vantage point in the time of the years that I was there versus his research efforts. But uh, I suspect you'll find a lot of parallels. Thank you very much. Um, to all of those who have attended, I have put, uh, well, you can't see that. So here we go to everyone. Um, I'm gonna put my email address in the chat. So if you all have any questions or anything follow up, please feel free to reach out. Um, again, thank you all very much, and I hope you have a great evening. Take care. Thank you.